Hi, this is Terry Kushma here at Penn State University. And what we would like to discuss today is part three in our presentation on materials and nanotechnology. Specifically, what we're looking at is synthesis and applications. So today, what we're gonna do, we've already done part one and part two. Part one covered the nanoparticle synthesis and, and an overview of uh, processes down to attrition. We had a part two was on pyrolysis. <clears throat> so today we're going to focus on some other methods to manufacture nanoparticles and we're also going to look at specific applications that we could use once we manufacture these nanoparticles. So let's take a look at the RF plasma synth synthesis technique. Uh, the starting material itself is placed on a pedestal and heated under a vacuum by RF uh, heating coils. Uh, then a high temperature plasma is created by uh, flowing a gas such as helium through the system in the vicinity of the coils. Uh, when the material is heated beyond the evaporation point, the vapor nucleates on the gas atoms, which diffuses up a core collector rod to form nanoparticles. Uh, the particles can be passivated by introducing other gases such as an oxidizer. And in the case of aluminum nanoparticles, uh, oxygen forms a thin layer of aluminum oxide around the particle of the, the aluminum, and this prevents uh, further uh, growth of the species, uh, aggregation and agglomeration. So RF uh, plasma synthesis is a very popular method for creating ceramic nanoparticles and, and powders. However, this uh, does feature a uh, very low mass yield, so it's really, we can't produce things by uh, the millions of tons. So this shows us a, a schematic example of the system. So this uh, is from the Paul and Owens book. This is a book that I use as an auxiliary book. I think there's a newer uh, version than the 2003 version, uh, but this is a nice book on uh, nano manufacturing in here. So it shows the uh, system, how it's configured, at least the schematic version of that. Uh, and now let's take a look at a, a similar system, a thermal decomposition system. Uh, th thermal decomposition is the chemical decomposition of a substance into its, uh, it should be into its constituents by heating. Uh, a bulk material is heated beyond the decomposition temperature in an evacuated furnace tube. Uh, the precursor material may contain metal cations and molecular anions or, or metal organic solids. For example, we can look at lithium derivatives. Uh, lithium particles can be synthesized by heating uh, the, the lithium nitride in a quartz tube under vacuum. Uh, when heated uh, to around 375, the nitrogen out gases from the bulk material and the lithium atoms coalesce and form nanoparticles. So this is a basic configuration of this system and certainly an issue after we make the lithium, as in all nanoparticles for the most part, and especially lithium being a, a group one material, uh, these materials uh, certainly want to chemically react, right? So one of the, the key ingredients, I guess, or key uh, components of this process is the ability, once we make the lithium nanoparticles, is to stabilize them in an inert environment, often, you know, a material like uh, argon, et cetera. So another uh, material or another process to make materials is called the pulsed laser method. So I guess this is fairly intuitive. The pulsed lasers have been employed to make silver nanoparticles from silver nitrate solutions. Uh, what we look at is a disc rotates, a, a silver disc rotates in a solution while a laser beam is pulsed with energy uh, to create disc hot spots on the disc. Uh, as the silver nitrate is reduced, this forms chemically silver nanoparticles, and certainly the size of the nanoparticles controlled by the energy of the laser and the rotating disc speed. So this is basically the applied energy dwell time to a, a, an area. So we're looking at a, a, a unit of energy uh, per unit area to give us this uh, uh, localized energy to create the nanoparticle or the energy to create the nanoparticle localized. So pulse lasers have also been played, employed in uh, aqueous media at room temperature without reducing agents or organic ligands. Uh, as you recall, capping agents are required for gold nanoparticles 
And a problem with these gold nanoparticles is the ligands that are necessary to control as capping agents to control the size, uh, like the citrate uh, that we examined earlier in the first presentation. What that might do later in our process when we have the gold nanoparticle with the citrate, we might want to put a thiol on there. And basically what the citrate is going to do is uh, block the interaction of the thiol with the gold. So that's a that's a, a, a something that we have to deal with. So this uh, gold cattle, uh, this gold capping, uh, actually prevents the chemical activity that we want to might take place. So this uh, is, is an issue, and we get around that by the pulse laser method, because we mechanically make the particle. Uh, and we don't need a chemical capping agent. It's physically made through the energy of the laser and the coalescing of the, the material. So again, this is important because we're looking at uh, uh, the aqueous material that doesn't have reducing agents or organic ligands in it. It's basically just that ambient is going to uh, mechanically control or quench this the, the energy to control the, the size of the particle. So. Uh, Pulsulators also can create uh, homogeneous particles uh, without temperature segregation that are typical of high temperature processes. And that's important, uh, certainly. Uh, and one of the important things is, is it limits the, the power and, and reduces the cost of the material. Uh, so alloy nanoparticles are an increasing interest uh, due to their beneficial properties in contrast to uh, you know, homogeneous materials. Uh, alloy nanoparticles benefit from the fact that their optical and catalytic as well as magnetic product uh, properties are actually tunable uh, based on the elemental compositions of the particles that we're creating. So uh, these, there's well-studied biometallic systems uh, where we could use combinations of gold and silver and produce similar lattice contents while the two elements are completely miscible over the entire composition range. So both metals display intense and well-defined surface plasmon resonance bands in the visible optical absorption range. And so these uh, are, are really good uh, tags for like biological entities. Uh, and, and so this, this tag or the color of the tag is dependent on the alloy composition. So this shows us a, a schematic version or a cartoon of what we're getting when we look at the pulse laser method. So we, we take our laser, uh, we interface it through a, a, a liquid, and then uh, at point A, well, actually we should probably examine this at uh, starting at point C. This is where we actually have the ablation happen. And this takes place, and then we'll also have cavitation at this point, which is the bubbling of the material. And this is gonna give us uh, our starting material or our ionized material and what's going to happen beyond that point we're actually going to have these high energetic particles are going to coalesce into atoms and clusters and then beyond that point what we're going to do is cool down and we're going to have uh, you know fragmentation and melting of these particles and then they're going to reach a steady state here further away from uh, the laser. So in some senses, this is quite analogous to what we looked at in the flame pyrolysis uh, entity, where at the start of the flame, where we initiated the flame, is where we had the most energy, and that's where we had our chemical constituents mixing together uh, to nucleate to form our hard aggregates, and this certainly could be a, 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 an analogy in, in, in how it does uh, how it forms these particles in, in the frame in the time frame. So incoming laser is pulsed and absorbed by the bulk material, forming again if we refer to C2. Uh, at point C1, the generation of the expanding cavitation bubble, uh, we make crystalline nanoparticles are formed by this cavitation, and then they nucleate and coalesce. At point B, uh, the coalesce and reaction generated species form colloidal particles. And at point C, uh, we have the ablation and cavitation bubble formation. So again, referring back to this uh, drawing, that, that this is the, the schematic of what's taking place uh, within the laser process. And again, I think the highlight of this is, or why we'd want to do this, 
this is in contrast to the uh, strictly chemical that we examine, for example, uh, gold nanoparticles with the citrate capping. Uh, this gives us particles that should be nude uh, so they don't have a, a capping agent on the outside. And this would allow us to, in place, maybe put a, a, a predetermined uh, material such as maybe polyethyl glycol, et cetera. And that would uh, be easy for us to do to get a, a controlled targeted nanoparticle maybe for a, a biological application. So again, this shows us a, a schematic vision of what we're doing. And again, the, the, the laser energy along with the rotation speed of the disc is gonna help us control the initial particle sizes in our uh, process. So that, that's a, a important. So again, let's take a look at, you know, now in our presentation, we're coming to the end of this, you know, specifically talking about uh, nanoparticle synthesis or common techniques that we use. Uh, we should take a look at, you know, how we're actually gonna use these nanoparticles, uh, for example, and again, these might link back or these ideas link back to the manufacturing process. Uh, you know, these things should over, all overlap in our mind, you know, uh, our applications and then, you know, certainly our methodology and how we're gonna have to uh, produce these particles. So let's take a look at uh, common materials, zinc oxide. So zinc oxide itself is opaque and it's antifungal. Uh, zinc oxide is often used as a UV blocking pigment in sunscreens, cosmetics, varnishes, fabrics, paints, etc., uh, It's incorporated in foot potters and garden supplies as an antifungal uh, material. And zinc oxide nanowires actually can uh, be used to increase the, elect the, the elastic toughness of some bulk materials. Nanowires in general do that because they act as a, a, a cross mechanical cross linker. So titanium dioxide as a material is used as an organic white pigment in paper, paints, plastics, and whitening agents. Uh, interestingly, titanium dioxide, depending on the formation and size, could also be uh, like a pinkish hue or a light blue, but the majority of it is whitening. Uh, titanium dioxide nanoparticles are also used as UV blocking pigments in sunscreens, cosmetics, varnishes, and fabrics, and paints. And titanium dioxide can also be produced to have a unique photocatalytic properties that make them uh, suitable for a, a number of applications like self-cleaning glass. So they put uh, these treatments on windshields, et cetera, so that it, uh, it, it decreases the wetting of the surface so that the water beads up on the surface and it cleans and it, it's an anti-fogging agent. So you can buy these types of materials to put on your sunglasses, et cetera. Uh, we could use these for detoxification of water and hydrolysis. So titanium dioxide is, is well known for that. And I guess the biggest application is uh, it's the backbone of paint. So I think that, uh, I don't know, 60%, 80% of common paint, you know, paint for a house or a car is made out of titanium dioxide. So certainly that's produced in uh, millions of tons per year. So uh, other nanoparticles, we can use iron, and, and historically iron was used for recording media in per se cassette tapes, et cetera. Uh, that's kind of old school technology, but it's been used in there. And oxide nanopar or iron oxide nanoparticles are often used as uh, uh, translucent, they're translucent to uh, visible lights, so while being opaque to UV light. So they actually are able to let visible light through and block out UV. So that's nice for uh, plating on windows, et cetera, so that the sun doesn't bleach your carpets and stuff like that. So applications include UV protecting coatings, various electromagnetic uses, electro-optic uses, and uh, old school data storage. So our, our, we also have iron alloys. So iron platinum nanoparticles have increased magnetism, and there's all kind of different uh, the alloys that they use uh, today in high density hard drives. So there, there's companies uh, that often employ our students that work in those areas. And, and what they're always after, to, you know, certainly to make this uh, the particle smaller, 
so that they can get more data per unit area. And so what they're, they're trying to do is, is maximize, uh, you know, certainly the, the magnetic properties and, and, and that comes along with controlling the domain or the uh, crystal arrangement of these alloys within the, the media. Another common material that we would use are applications of nanoparticle or alumina oxide. And these are certainly used in chemical mechanical polishing slurries uh, for maybe the semiconductor industry. And aluminum oxide is, I guess, the number one material for sandpaper. So if you would go to your local home builder supply and look at uh, sandpaper that you can buy commercially, uh, if you look on the back, it'll say aluminum oxide, et cetera. So it's a, it's a rather uh, hard material. Uh, that's well controlled and, and in sandpaper we control the size so that we can control the grit size we control uh, y You know the resultant uh, uh, Smoothness of the surface and we also use nano alumina in coatings and fluorescent uh, bulbs and that makes the uh, Bulb iridescent right so silver nanoparticles uh, they've used these silver nanoparticles for centuries uh, for antibacterial, so silver has excellent conductivity and has been used in antimicrobial for thousands of years. Uh, silver's antimicrobial potential increases with increased surface area. So again, that's a, a certainly right up the alley of nanoparticles. They have uh, you know low mass and high surface area, so we can use silver eff efficiently, and, and they often use uh, this silver antimicrobial. Uh, nanoparticles on materials such as band-aids or socks, et cetera, to keep the microbes from growing. So applications include biocides, uh, transparent inks, and antimicrobial plastics and bandages. And I know they put uh, uh, micro, uh, silver nanoparticles in materials uh, like sheetrock for building applications. So in case those materials get wet, like in a flood, they don't grow mold on them, which is certainly hazardous and dangerous, you know, so they impregnate these into building materials. And, and materials like uh, uh, shower curtains, so that they don't get moldy, et cetera. So that those are common things that you can buy, uh, you know, commercially today. So other applications, certainly gold is an important nanoparticle, and it's often used in a lot of applications because it has high chemical stability. Uh, uses for gold nanoparticles are typically catalytic and include DNA detection and oxidation of carbon monoxide. Uh, gold has certainly superior uh, conductivity, allowing gold nanoparticles to be used as probe centers and optical applications, and it can be used as a, a plasmon for uh, like biological tagging. Uh, gold is often used in, I guess, common uh, an application or atypical application. These are early pregnancy tests. And basically how these work, we have gold nanoparticles uh, coated with an antibody. And what this antibody is going to react to uh, proteins or hormones within a woman. And, and what it's going to do is actually uh, coalesce these particles together if there's a, a, a in the desired reaction phase. And what it's going to do is change the color or the apparent color of the uh, nanoparticles, and that's going to give us a signature uh, for pregnancy. So this is a probably one of the widest commercial uses of and first com commercial uses of gold nanoparticles contained with biology. You know, so it's a, a very nice example of how we would use this in, in, in today's market. Again, this shows you the applications here for this particular uh, uh, pregnancy test. There's also uh, zirconium dioxide nanoparticles. Uh, these could be used uh, at, for composites. Uh, they could use as wear coating, ceramics, dyes, cutting edges, and piezoelectric materials, as well as dielectrics. Uh, and then for these materials in general, what we can do with nanoparticles is doing a sintering process. And basically what a sintering process does, or, or one of the things that we're going to look at or highlight, is uh, we know that a nanoparticle has a lower melting temperature than its bulk constituent. So what we're going to do is mechanically pack these powders together and then apply heat and not heat, melting heat, the heat that would be, 
needed to melt bulk materials, we can apply less energy. And what that's going to do is uh, initiate this response to where the nanoparticles are going to coalesce together and form a strong material. So basically what we're going to do is uh, use a casting method where we compress powders and that's going to be in a soft phase. Then we're going to take that complex geometric shape, uh, place it into a furnace, and then that annealing furnace is probably going to drive out byproducts uh, or, or adhesion promoters, and it's going to make the particles fuse together. So what we can do is create complex parts with without machining. So that's a goal. And these products over the years have gotten stronger and stronger. So initially they were used in, in areas like keep creating gearing for uh, systems that didn't have that much mechanical strain on them, like lawn mowers, like a steering unit, you know, column in a lawn mower. But now they're actually used, I'm told, in automobiles and trucks, like for gearing in there. So these products could be made to be quite robust and made uh, at, at a, an affordable price. Interestingly, here in Pennsylvania, St. Mary's, which is, oh, I don't know, probably uh, 75 miles from here, uh, they're one of the largest you know, centers of uh, centering in, in the country. And again, we could use centering or the process of centering or that idea of the nucleation and the lowering of the melting temperatures. We could use this in areas of like 3D printing and uh, additive manufacturing. So uh, certainly an important application and why nanoparticles are certainly in strong demand. So because centering temperature does not have to reach the melting point of the bulk material, centering is often chosen as a shaping process for materials with extremely high melting points such as tungsten and molybdenum. So this shows us a schematic, a classic schematic uh, diagram of how centering takes place. So basically what we're going to do is take small particles, apply a moderate amount of temperature, and allow these materials, uh, these small particles to coalesce into uh, bigger materials. And, and I guess one of the advantages is uh, necessarily we're going to be making materials that are in some senses uh, maybe that have like a polycrystalline impact to them. And what they're able to do is uh, I think in some senses they wouldn't have a, a, a planar uh, mechanical fatigue associated with them like you would have in a single crystal because the poly would break up those fatigue lines. So mechanically, I think these have a lot of advantages compared to even like a single crystal uh, form made, formed uh, metals, etc. So uh, they could be useful in those areas, you know, certainly. And we could probably control uh, the domains of the polycrystalline so th that they would per se be, you know, isotropic or anisotropic in that formation of, of the orientation of the polymer regime. So let's take a look at the, you know, the centering as just a, a process unto its own. Uh, there's six common mechanisms in centering. Uh, we would have surface diffusion, uh, diffusion of atoms along the surface of a particle. Uh, we would have vapor transport, which is the evaporation of atoms which condense into a different surface. Uh, the lattice diffusion from the surface, where the atoms from the surface diffuse through the lattice. And lattice diffusion from grain boundaries. This is where the atoms from the grain boundaries diffuse through the lattice. And then grain boundary diffusion, where the atoms diffuse along the grain boundary. And then naturally, we can have plastic deformation, which is dislocation motion which causes the, the flow of the matter in our formation of our material into our final product. So we take a look at uh, you know, the stages of sintering uh, when we have a potter. So we form a loose potter. You, the potter's formed uh, loose, but actually in essence, we're mechanically compressing this potter as much as we can without uh, uh, applying uh, more thermal energy. And at that point, what we're going to do is to start to apply thermal energy. And this thermal energy is going to uh, decrease the grain boundaries at this point. So we would form an intermediate stage. And then along further uh, heat application, what we're going to do is make a more uh, a polymer surface uh, with larger grains in there and less grain boundaries uh, to give us a more durable uh, uh, final product. 
So this shows us uh, this schematic or diagram, not schematic, I guess uh, this graph is gonna show us a typical uh, system to, you know, the time that it would take us to uh, make a ceramic structure. So we would, when we uh, do centering to a ceramic, we would do the compression. Uh, and then we, what we're gonna do to eliminate uh, the thermal stress and fatigue is we have to ramp, ramp up these systems in a controlled method. So we'll ramp for a number of hours. So this on our X axis, we can see that this is in minutes. Uh, so we're, we're gonna ramp up for you know three and a half hours or so to uh, 450 degrees. Then what we're gonna do is maintain that dwell on there for a couple more hours you know, for 100 minutes or so. And then from that point, what we're gonna be able to do is, once we reach that, uh, an equilibrium state where we're not gonna have that much fatigue, we can go up to in a higher, uh, like uh, six to seven degrees uh, per minute, ramp up to 850 degrees, and then leave that dwell for about 10 minutes. And then we're gonna certainly have to cool this off slowly to maintain that uh, the, the, the uh, polycrystal, uh, area that we just made. And again, this process, when we take a look at it, uh, we're getting on to uh, 450 hours, 475 hours. So this, this does take a long time in the furnace and cost uh, uh, quite a bit of money, uh, but it's less than the, the melting of the material. So it's economically viable to, and certainly we eliminate the machining of these complex parts. So here's some uh, unique novel applications. Uh, we can do zirconium dental centering. So these are like customizable. So we, we measure the patient, see what size teeth they need, to, you know, get a like a CAD drawing of these teeth. And we're able to compress these teeth in a small machine and make these custom parts uh, through this centering compact process to the patient. So I know that they use this quite a bit today and uh, zirconium uh, it is nice because it's white uh, like teeth, so it, it's aesthetically desirable, and the material is fairly durable, uh, you know, on the order, you know, it, getting to enamel on the teeth, et cetera. So this is a nice application, and uh, these machines are moderately small. They're kind of desktop machines that we can see, and this is how I think that uh, dental implants, et cetera, are made today. And then this shows us some centering applications. Up here on the left, we see these complex parts, and these are complex car parts. And, and this is funny, that, you know, these are like movie stars here. And they showed that they, they make these, uh, they can use these in 3D printing using a, a, a centering process with nanoparticles to make parts that you can't buy anymore. So uh, this gentleman's a car collector, so he needs a part that he can't buy, so he can uh, send out a CAD drawing or take a picture of it, and they can actually make these parts, uh, these highly desirable parts, uh, you know, at will. So that's a, a nice application of here that shows that, uh, you know, less machining time uh, along with these teeth, customizable parts. So this, this is a, an efficient way of making things. So at, this is what we did, you know, we outlined in three parts, uh, nanomaterial and synthesis approaches. And I'd like to conclude at this part, there's an, you know, an infinite number of applications we could review and interesting, uh, but uh, I hope it's provided some good ideas and links for you to further explore. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and we'll take a look uh, further at our, uh, our endeavor into nano manufacturing. Take care now.